Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, Boston Globe and WBUR. Tonight's program is also supported in part by the Mass Cultural Council. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or via comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful tonight to have this opportunity to explore this important story in American history with our distinguished guests. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Gretchen Soren is Distinguished Pref Professor and Director of the Cooperstown Graduate Program of the State University of New York. She has curated innumerable exhibits, including the Smithsonian, including with the Smithsonian, the Jewish Museum, and the New York State Historical Association, while working as a museum educator, a director, and a consultant to more than 200 museums over 30 years before returning to lead the Cooperstown Graduate Program. She is the author of Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. And with Rick Burns is director of the forthcoming PBS documentary, Driving While Black, Race, Space and Mobility in America. Rick Burns is an internationally recognized documentary filmmaker and writer. Burns has been writing, directing and producing historical documentaries for over 25 years since his collaboration with the PBS series, The Civil War which he produced with his brother, Ken, and co-wrote with Jeffrey Ward. Since founding Steeplechase Film in 1989, he has directed some of the most distinguished programs for, for PBS, and his work has won numerous film and television awards. Most recently, he is director with Gretchen Soren of the forthcoming PBS documentary, Driving While Black, Race, Space, and Mobility in America. Amir Lewis, producer and editor of the documentary, Driving While Black, has built an exceptional editing career with credits spanning documentaries and narrative genres, beginning with the 1998 film Slam, which received both the prestigious Sundance Grand Jury Prize and the Cannes Camera Door. Most recently, he has parlayed his editorial experience into a supervising story producer role for the acclaimed Netflix docuseries Rapture. In between filmmaking projects, Amir also teaches the fine art of storytelling at both NYU and Brooklyn's Brooklyn College Fernstein Graduate School. I am also so pleased to introduce Spencer Crew, Acting Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, who will moderate this evening's discussion. He has worked in public history institutions for more than 25 years and has served as a professor of history at George Mason, Mason University. He was president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center for six years and worked at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History for 20 years, including nine years as director. At each of those institutions, he sought to make history accessible to the public through innovative and inclusive exhibitions and public programs. He has published extensively in the areas of African American and public history. Please join me in welcoming our special guests this evening. After this brief clip from the, from the documentary Driving While Black, Race, Space and Mobility in America, which airs next Tuesday, October 13th. We look forward to the discussion with this distinguished panel. Thank you so much. She's my deep police. The notion of driving while black reminds us that that's not available to all Americans. Living while black, sleeping while black, eating while black, moving while black. That goes all the way back to day one. The power to choose to be able to move freely in space. We live in a country where it's never been everybody's right. If you're an African American and you can afford a car, it provides a powerful alternative what the automobile allows is personal freedom. 
I think the automobile allows us to understand the way that African Americans have moved forward in this country and the way that African Americans have been pushed back. For African Americans, trips across country are not adventures. They can often be trials. With a car full of your family whom you love, and your wife is saying, we gotta stop for the night, and what do you do? So that's where the Green Book was indispensable, to give you some way to find a place where you could get some rest, get something to eat without being violated. Once they were inside this building, nobody was gonna worry them. People are not going to let themselves be paved over. They will insist that their voices are heard. There are still so many dangers. African Americans are feeling a similar fear as their grandparents felt. That's how y'all black people are. We have to engage history with a kind of brutal honesty. And until we get to a place in which we actually are trying to live up to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for every human being who is in our society, then we're not there yet. Well, thank you for that pre uh, the preview. I think we're all looking forward to seeing the full version of the film. I'd like to take a minute just to thank the Kennedy Library Foundation for sponsoring this and for bringing us all together this evening. And what I'd like to do is start with Gretchen Soren and just ask her what caused you actually to want to investigate this particular topic? Well, well, Spencer, the, um, I, I think my initial um, idea for uh, just doing this research was because uh, a scholar friend of mine handed me a copy of the Green Book. It was actually not even a copy, it was a cover of the Green Book. Mm -hmm. And I was intrigued. I had never heard of it. And I thought, I, I've got to find out about this. You, can you imagine a, a, a travel book, a travel guide for just for African Americans? And this was probably about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was long before there was a film. It was long before anybody had even thought about um, the Green Book. And then um, it became a, kind of a, a personal discovery. I, I started to realize that the story that I was uncovering bit by bit, as I was peeling back the onion, was really my story. It was really about, it helped me to understand my parents and, and their behavior when we went on trips, when we traveled. Um, and as you're aware, since you were one of the people that I interviewed, um, the more I dug into it, I found out that our generation, we were the, we were the kids sitting in the back seat um, as our parents were driving through what what was really dangerous territory we didn't know anything about it we didn't know it was frightening but um it was it was these are scary times and their behaviors were something that were foreign to to all of us we didn't we didn't quite understand them so i would say it was an opportunity for me to learn about and to understand my parents and then i would say there was another reason and it, it, as we got deeper and deeper and as rick and i started working on the documentary and that is, it became um, an urgent issue of national concern. Yeah. Um, and and this, this is a film that is so important right now. Um, and a book that was so important right now because of the condition of our country and the relationship um, in our country between African-Americans and law enforcement. It's interesting you talk about how important it is now. Now, how long have you two been working on the... You, have, you said it's been 25 years for the book? And I, uh, our... On and off for 25 years. <laughs> uh, and, and Rick and I have been working together for five years. For five years. So when you started, the country wasn't where it was today. What prompted you to want to turn the book into a film? And why did Rick agree to join this project? R Rick agreed, I, th I think, I mean, I'll let him speak for himself, but... Um, for me, he was the storyteller that that I wanted to work with me on this project. I think he is an absolutely incredible storyteller. Um, and uh, I just so uh, love his documentary films that it, there it was no question I wanted him to work with me. I always also call him my accomplice because I feel that um, African Americans, we're only we're only thirteen percent of the population of this country, and we really need, um, white 
allies and white accomplices. And I, he calls himself my partner. I call him my accomplice uh, in this project because it's it's so important. Uh, and there are those times in American history when when white Americans have joined with African Americans to make amazing things happen. Um, and then having Amir come into the process was, you know, was a little icing on the cake. Um, you know, to have this very talented um, African American man who's this wonderful editor come in was was, you know, that 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 topped it off. I th I think it's spectacular. I think it's a spectacular film and and very important at this time. So, Rick, what about it got your attention? You know, I was listening to um, what Gretchen just said, and it made me feel really clear that I, th I think the same thing that every time something really significant and meaningful has happened by the way of major transformation in American history, um, African Americans have drafted white Americans into a, co into a coalition to make change happen. I think if you just looked back at the last 160 years, you'd see that as the case. Not that things haven't changed otherwise, but when the big wheels have turned, African Americans have turned to white Americans and said, it's now or never. And that happened in the 1860s. And it happened you know, in some of the first decades of the 20th century. It happened in the 1960s. And it's happening again now. And you know, it wasn't the same time as now five years ago when Gretchen came to me. But you know, we'd worked together before on the series my colleagues and I did about the history of New York. Gretchen, among her many, many gifts, is seriously versed in the colonial history of New York and the slave revolts of 1741 and 1712, um, and helped us immeasurably with that. So we were kind of unindicted co-conspirators going back 25 years. Okay. So Amir, how did you get drafted or talked into or <laughs> enticed into this project? Um, I'm familiar with uh, with Rick's work. Uh, you know, just uh, the documentary community in New York is very, very small. So eventually, you wind up meeting everybody or working uh, with ev with everyone. Um, so when the call came through, I answered it. it you know, I said, "Oh, yeah, I'll I'll come check this out and see what this is all about." Um, and then they started to tell me what this story was about, and and I was I was partially interested in a, in a Green Book film but much more interested in the, the larger discussion of race, space, and mobility. Because, you know, to be perfectly honest, the term driving while black didn't start until 1993, 1994. And the Green Book goes up until about the, generously, the mid 70s. Feel free to correct me, Gretchen. Um, 66. So, yeah. so, you know, with that in mind, the term, you know, sort of, we, we weren't really addressing that. And so when Rick sort of, you know, mulled around in his head and said, we need to sort of expand this story, especially since the Hollywood version did such a <laughs> not good job of, of addressing the Green Book in, in its entirety and, and its depth. Uh, and so we knew we wanted to do that, but we, we wanted to make the story larger. So that's what really sort of pulled me in. Amir, did this story have any personal uh, resonance for you in terms of your own life history, a story, or family history? Uh, I don't remember my my father uh, using the Green Book. He was a musician, so he was on the road a, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that was particularly a thing for him. But having his movements policed, having my own movements policed, sure. Yeah, uh, you know. I, I, another thing that, that Rick sort of brought to the table uh, was this idea of sort of the double helix, uh, you know, and sort of the recumbent D DNA strands and how history sort of bends back on itself in this way. Uh, I just wanted to do that on camera, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we can sort of find these moments where history was bending back on itself and sort of link them together, that was a very, very powerful thing. Uh, we then started sort of referring to it as, uh, I think I told Gretchen when we interviewed her one time, uh, that the condition of black people in America is, is akin to the worst game of shoots and ladders ever invented, <laughs> you, you know, where we take one step forward and then we're asked to sort of slide six steps down the ladder and then sort of we fight back and we come back another two or three steps. So that was the thing that, you know, those were the things that sort of really pulled me in and, uh, and sort of connected my own personal experience to it. Well, the title of it is Driving While Black. And so why do you pick that title? Uh, you could have picked a lot of different ways of describing what you are talking about in your work. I'm sort of interested, 
why that title? I don't know. Could I jump in, Gretchen? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. But as long as you take credit mm-hmm. for, for coming up with the name. Well, you know, I think, you know, it, it really emerged out of the work that we were doing and a sense that, you know, the film is about race, space, and mobility in America, as Amir puts it. Um, and that's why it's the subtitle. Um, it's also about African Americans on the road during the era of Jim Crow, um, you know, roughly, you know, from the 1920s, you know, down through the 19, early 1960s. Um, but driving while black, this contemporary phrase, um, has this sort of provocative in your face now feel to it, driving while black. But the fact is, is that it's not a contemporary phenomenon. It is that, but it has this deep, deep set of roots that go back and back and back and back, spiraling in that double helical way. And so we wanted to have a title that spoke to now and then suggested that there's a history to this. You gotta find the history of this. As Herb Boyd, incredible activist, says, you know, it's not just driving while black, it's living while black, it's eating while black, it's moving while black, and you gotta get to the roots of it. What are the roots? So the point is to get to the roots of driving while black, you have to go all the way back to the, you know, to 1619. Um, and when the, when the first Africans were mobilized against their will, immobile in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the hull of, of the slave ships, to come here and to have their mobility restricted so that white people could make money out of their labor. That's the beginning. And we wanted to take it all the way through concentrating on this revolutionary moment in the 50, first 50 years of the 20th century when auto mobility offered African Americans the ability to self locomote outside the context of Jim Crow. So that was, you know, driving while black became inevitable for us, I think, pretty, pretty, pretty soon into the process. Well, Gretchen, as you were uh, starting this work for the book and then the film, did you think about it being as broadly impactful as Rick has described? How did you initially see this unfolding? Well, you know, it's interesting. It started out as my dissertation. And as a dissertation, it had an incredibly academic title. Um, and it, What was that? Uh, what was the title? The title was African Americans on the Road in the Era of Jim Crow. Okay. <laughs> very, very academic, yes. <laughs> And, no colon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and it was funny because I, I got a lot of pushback from my uh, committee because usually at the higher you go in academia, the more narrow your topic. And yet my topic began with slavery because I felt you had to begin with slavery, but it also was national. It was national in scope. And it wasn't just, you know, Newark, New Jersey, 1710 to 1712, you know, which is the typical dissertation yes. topic. I did get a lot of pushback, but for me, this story um, is also about the automobile and a, a story that is so, you know, when we're talking about the automobile, you've got to be talking about roads, you've got to be talking about space, you've got to be talking about mil- uh, mobility, you've got to be talking about movement. And it was movement across the country, north to south, east to west. It was movement, um, you know, going back home for African Americans who had come north during the Great Migration. It was about going back home. It was, and it was, you know, when you're talking about movement um, and mobility for African Americans, it was showing how that was different for white Americans than it was for African Americans, how African Americans that movement was constantly restricted and they were constantly having to find ways to make do, to go around, to find um, ways of preventing violence, really. And so, you know, the project was big from the beginning. It was very difficult, I think, to figure out both in the book and in the film, what what places do we talk about? Because there are so many places. Could be anywhere. Right. There were so many places that we could we had, I think, our very first list of places. There must have been 25 or 30 uh, different places that we we thought thought we could include as vignettes within the film. 
Well, it's, it's interesting because in reading the book, and I'm sure as people see the film, they'll see that it does cover a long period of time. And it's almost as though you're telling African-American history from a motorized point of view. Would that be a fair way to describe it? I think so. I, I think absolutely. Um, you're, you're seeing the, uh, the expanse of African-American history as told through this lens. And it's, it's crystal clear. I mean, I think that's one of the things uh, I've had people say to me, you know, this is, it's just so clear. It makes it so incredibly, um, uh, you know, the story is so compelling and yet so clear. Well, uh, Amir or Rick, so what did you learn new in this process of creating this film? Amir. I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, if you're not an academic, uh, you learn things as you experience them or as you have a need to discover them. Uh, so, you know, I'd say over the last 20 years, most of my knowledge has come from working on various films. It, you know, not that I don't read, although with the advent of the cell phone, I read less and less, you know, every day, unfortunately. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I see your stack of books behind you, Spencer. Uh, I, I also have a, a stack of books in my house. Unfortunately, uh, many of them are just for show. I'm, I'm quite sure that you've read all the ones that are actually- oh, of know, course. Behind. Cover to cover, every one, that's right. <laughs> I, have, I have a tendency to buy all of my friends' books. Most of my friends are, are in art or, or academics, and, and I have to have the book on the shelf in case they ever come to the house. And, you know, and then you, oh, yeah, I loved it. I loved it, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I do, one of the things about making a documentary film is that you inhale an enormous amount of information that you need to, to make the film. And so I was very indebted to not only you know people like you know Gretchen you know who create these incredible uh, works of nonfiction, but also to the incredible team we have at, at Steeplechase. I mean, you, you know, co-producers uh, Emily File and Catherine Clenard went through all of these books, all of these books, and sort of highlighting and creating and starting to to cobble together. You know, uh, along with Rick and with with uh, Bonnie Lafave, um, you know, our other you know, uh, head of uh, people chase. We need that to then be able to then start to sit down and craft uh, the film. So I I can't even begin to. I I I wish I could come up with one particular thing where I'm like, oh, I learned that and that really changed the the course of my life. But you know, like I said, it, it really is just a more a matter of bringing in all this information and saying that thing that happened in 1942 is so eerily similar to something that I went through in 1987, you know, or looking at older photographs and older pieces of, of archival footage and realizing that that's your family. Like you can see your family in, in these people. And I, I think that's always really important. What would be really great is if we start to see our family past the boundaries of race. I hope that people watching this film who are an African-American can see their family in both the positive uh, and negative moments uh, in the film and sort of say, oh yeah, I dealt with something like that. And I now connect with the film uh, in that way. That makes good sense. Rick, how about you? Well, you know, the, um, you know, in The Shining, incredible movie, uh, there's the Overlook Hotel. And the, the amazing thing about The Shining is in the story of it is that it's a place that is haunted continually by another place that's also there at the same time. But the people who enter it don't necessarily know that that other space is there as well. I was trying to find a way to characterize what it was like to be, I was born in 1955 um, in Baltimore and lived until I was eight in Delaware. When there were still colored fountains, white fountains in Delaware, above the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and, you know, I'm a child of the automobile on the highway. You know, the family vacation, get in, go from Newark, Delaware to Rehoboth. And I had this uncanny feeling like when it gets on kind of like summer afternoons, you know, as a child, where you kind of feel a little floaty, a little like, 
you know, you go up to your bedroom, feels like there's something else there, like there's something in the air. Mm. And what I learned in this project was that that something else that's there for white Americans is this entire parallel experience. Mm. That is, aspects of it might be news to African Americans, but the general experience that it alludes to is completely familiar. For white Americans, it's either been intentionally denied, totally uh, uh, unknown, or willfully obscured from themselves, as if we're floating through the Overlook Hotel, hearing the presence of ghosts and fellow travelers, and somehow not aware of them. So for me, it was this, it was uncanny, it was kind of exhilarating and um, grounding to understand, right, that's why, that's why there is always this feeling of like multiplicity. You know, when Mrs. Jennings, our cleaning lady, went home in Newark, Delaware, across to the other side of the traps, what was that about? You know, like, you know, I knew that, I knew Mrs. Jennings from the time I was four years old. And then Virginia took her place. Um, and then, so, wow, you know, there's that space and our space, mm -hmm. and, and the two only meet, surprise, surprise, over issues having to do with work and labor. Oh my God, suddenly, through the optic of the work Gretchen has done, you realize that this uncanny convergence of spaces um, it has been there the whole time, that it, has, it is not just a, an American story. This is the American story. There, I mean, every aspect of American history comes together in this. So for me, I felt, you know, having been so blessed to work with my brother Ken, you know, from the 1980s onward, I feel like this is, you know, for me, a kind of a culminating revelatory kind of experience because everything comes together in it. So, you know, it has that kind of quality of like, it, you know, what Freud called the uncanny, you know, it's both. You know, it both is completely known, but completely unknown at the same time. And that doubleness is part of the experience of it. So I just say, you know, to my white American colleagues, fellow citizens, come on in and freak yourself out with this. Because what you'll do is recognize our world with a dimensionality and a clarity that you've never seen before. And you'll look that when you go into Newark, Delaware, you know, in 1960 on your, in your parents' car, you will not only see the Rotary Club sign, welcome to Newark, Delaware, you'll see the Ku Klux Klan sign as well. I'll bring there side by side. And that kind of the doubleness of that, you know, iconography is just astonishing. You know, the thing that I'll leave you with right now is there was a banner proudly strewn across strung across main street um in greenville texas um the kind of thing all of us see so there's a version of that in everybody's mind this one said greenville texas the blackest soil the whitest people so this eternal doubleness of the american experience this kind of parallelness of it is something which and perilousness is something which I think is Gretchen's work schools us all in in a really extraordinary way. I want to come back to you on that, but I want to go to Gretchen for uh, for the next question. Gretchen, um, you are what we call a public historian. Yes. And uh, so is that what prompted you to take a book and want to make it into a film? That's not normally the pathway followed by a scholarly book. What sort of prompted you to go in that direction? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think of myself as a storyteller, too, because I do exhibitions. And exhibitions are about telling, telling good visual stories. And um, I'm also, I'm also a, a, an oral historian. I like to gather, as you know, uh, being one of my uh, subjects, <laughs> I'm, I, I love to have people tell their own stories and tell their own history. And so this project, um, as, I went, as I went through... Um, the research, every time I met someone, I asked them to show me their 
their their snapshots, their family photographs, the the pictures they took on vacation, the pictures they took as they traveled with their family. Um, you know, all of those I had assembled, and um, I even had some home movies that my my father was a photographer, so we always had a dark room in our house. We always, you know, he always had a camera around his neck. He was always taking, he was always taking pictures. So I love to gather those pictures. And um, Rick and I were together uh, at OAH on a panel um, for the NEH, for the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I asked him, I said, you know, Rick, can we have lunch afterwards? And, and we went to a little restaurant in Manhattan to have lunch and, um, we were, after we finished eating, I pulled out my laptop and I flipped through some of these photographs that I digitized. Um, and I said, I think this should be a film. You know, it's about movement. It's about, it's visual. It's so visual. You know, the book has 75 images in it because, you know, usually dissertations, my husband teases me all the time that academic dissertations do not have pictures but mine had pictures <laughs> uh, because I'm a public historian and because the subject is so visual. You know, the 20th century is about the camera and the automobile. Um, and so I flipped through the pictures that I had gathered with Rick and I said, I think this should be your next project. Mm. And he said, I agree. And that's how we that's how we got together and started. Well, I've, I've always said saying no to Gretchen is very hard to do. So, <laughs> you know, it's impossible, <laughs> so Amir and Rick, um, Rick, you were talking about the special nature of the story you were telling and how to connect it between different communities and different worldviews of, of life. So how do you how do you think about bringing that through in the film? And Amir, how do you think about that in terms of the, your editing and production of, of the film? To give it that sense of the separateness and the need to be aware of how that plays out. Huh. I, well, I mean, there is a separateness to the post-production process because, first of all, you know, the the film is broken up into many processes, right? Or, or there's the research stage, you know, where there's that all of that collating of of information that is pre-existing information, books like. You know, Dr. Sorens and your own, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. You bring all that stuff together. Then there's a production stage where you shoot interviews uh, with, uh, you know, esteemed people like uh, Spencer Crew, you know, and you get them to sit down and sort of tell you all of the brilliant things that they have going on in their head in a clear and concise, you know, sort of way. And then you have the post production process. So I really sort of came in at the, the tail end of things. And I'm looking at everything that's been done before and saying, okay, I know you thought this was the story, but it's actually over here, right. you know, or let's, let's look at that. And then that leads to a lot of fighting and bloodshed in the edit room and it's very ugly. <laughs> and, and then you sort of kiss and make up and, and you have a film, you know, after that. So there's a lot going on, but yeah, it's really interesting because Rick was talking to me about, or just talking to the audience about, the sense of two worlds and how uh, and sort of inviting his, his white brethren to come into the world. And that's a new thing for a lot of white people. But Du Bois has been talking about double consciousness for black folks yep. ever since, you know, pretty much since we, we got here. We've always had to learn to, uh, to sort of exist in your world and exist in our own, uh, you know. So that's not necessarily uh, a new thing for us, but it is interesting uh, seeing moments at, the, at those sort of brief intersections in history where where white people have come in and, and, and sort of worked with black folks, and it's good for people to see another way of doing things. But that that's sort of a Tuesday for for, for black people. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I mean, existing in two worlds. Yes, no, absolutely. Rick, Rick, what about you? What how did you navigate this in terms of connecting the audience to these issues? You know, I think that the the, um, the 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 genius of the inspiration of Gretchen's work is that it's so integrative. It's bringing so many things together, you know, across time and across space. Um, and so the the imperative to connect is built into the topic itself. 
topic itself is about making connections. Um, and I think that, you know, just the way the Negro Motorist Guide, Victor Green, Victor and Alma Green's extraordinary uh, way of navigating the complex, you know, double space of America um, was, a, was about making connections across, across space. You know, I think of, you know, I think that our motive, you know, our kind of MO was like, you know, we're going to follow Gretchen. This is going to be like the Airbnb of kind of, you know, American knowledge. This was going to be a way that you could navigate from Mobile to Denver to Minneapolis to Los Angeles to Detroit so that the way we made the selection of what, because you could go anywhere and tell this story in America, but you can't go everywhere in a two-hour film. So what are the where's that you're going to boil it down to? Well, each one had to be a place where this story, race, space, and mobility, was concentrated in a particularly powerful way, um, and in a different way. New Orleans, this extraordinary sort of, you know, kind of transportation break at the foot of the Mississippi, which had its own special early role in the migration of peoples, and especially peoples of color. Um, Detroit, Motor City. You know, the place where the automobile world began, um, where African Americans migrated in the Great Migration, the greatest migration, the greatest movements of people in American history, you know, happened during the African American Great Migration between 1916 and 1970. And they were drawn to better paying jobs um, in places like Detroit first. Um, Los Angeles, you know, the international home of the highway, but also of the car, but also of the highway. So the interstate highway system was a crucial part of the story. So each place had its own story to tell, but they were all connected. They were different in space, but they were all connected by this. So that's why I say it is like, you know, film itself is a kind of like natural Airbnb, um, where what we're doing is we're using the airwaves in this case to make connections um, among different peoples, different places, et cetera. So I think that that was deeply embedded in the um, modus operandi, in the material. Um, uh, I would also argue in the medium itself that motion pictures, you know, the form of photography that turned static photography, images that are fixed in place, and then snap, 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 release them, disperse them into a world of motion. That was exactly contemporary with the invention of the automobile. So in a way, you know, just as those wheels start moving, so does the image start moving. And so I feel there's something almost in the DNA of the art form itself, which doesn't exist without motion, which suggests to you that an, a subject that is intrinsically about mobility and mobilization and how, you know, you know, things need to be released from one space and allowed to move into another was built into it. So I think that what we found, what my colleagues and I found working with Gretchen, working with Amir, working with, I have to say, Spencer, you and this incredible cadre of talent that Gretchen brought into the project. I mean, really, the most extraordinary group of writers, thinkers, academics, uh, activists, etc., were assembled by Gretchen for this project. Um, and I think that what really kind of came out of that was this thing, which was like, you know, it was, there's a kind of a choral harmony that comes out of it because they're all speaking in different accents from different place. And yet at the same time, they're singing the same story. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's why I say, you know, I feel like we should all stand up and sort of like sing hallelujah, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, there is a kind of, you know, sort of a kind of integrative harmonics that comes out of this story that should be thrilling. It should be liberating to people. It should be thrilling to them. And they should go because they're seeing the truth. And the truth is hard, but the truth is clean. And, you know, that kind of like getting to that cleanliness of reality is built into this story. No, and I think it also, has resonance. It, it also has resonance with with people. One of the things that I have noticed about this film, as you know, Rick and I uh, shown clips and earlier versions of it all over all over the place. 
And it has incredible resonance, not only for black people, but for white Americans, because everybody relates to the automobile and going on, on summer vacation with their family, going to the beach, going to um, you know, the national parks. It, it has resonance with everyone because everyone um, remembers those times very fondly. But then we're saying, oh, but it was a little different for African-Americans. It wasn't, um, yes, there were, there were happy times going to the beach, going, but they were going to the black beach. They were going to the beach that was called Ink Beach. You know, they were going to um, the black guest house because they couldn't stay at the white guest house. So it was a little different, but, but I think that the topic itself had incredible, has incredible resonance for everybody. I was thinking about that. Um, so what did you learn new from all this, since you, you said it's probably what your family had done and you are African-American. Rick talks about what uh, white Americans can gain from this. What can you as an African-American and others gain from this? Uh, who might say, well, this is my history. I know it, why should I have to follow, dig into this? You know, I, I grew up in this incredibly middle-class, middle-class family. Um, and my parents never talked about the segregation that they faced. Um, in, in, at Fort Bragg, my father was stationed at Fort Bragg. My mother was from Fayetteville, one of the most racist cities um, in the country. They never talked about that. Um, they talked about the good, the good people. And I have listened to my academic colleagues talk about the black middle class and how the black middle class has failed uh, the black lower class and how the black middle class has abandoned the black lower class. And for me, this was about understanding how the black middle class was working and pushing for civil rights every single day of their lives. Every time they went out in their automobiles, every time they went on vacation, every time they pushed the limits, they were working um, for civil rights. And so many of the people who owned these businesses were were protecting civil rights workers. They were taking the money from their businesses and putting it into the civil rights movement. They were housing the civil rights workers. They were feeding the civil rights workers. You know, they were they were selling sandwiches and and you know, women were selling sandwiches to to you know, to put into the civil rights movement. The black middle class has shown that they have worked incredibly hard to support civil rights. Maybe they've done it in their very middle-class, quiet, polite way, but they have been vigorous. And I, I, I really realized that about my parents and about all of these other African-Americans who were, were doing this day in and day out and taking really their lives in their hands when they went out um, on the road, when they traveled. I know for me, seeing the film and reading the book, the light bulb that went off that you talked about earlier was recognizing what our parents were going through yes. as we were sort of relaxing in the back of the car and not being aware of the world in which they were apart. The other part of it that strikes me is how that wasn't, this wasn't that long ago, that the most difficult era, eras existed, that um, you and I and others, I mean, it's probably much younger, um, but we're born right on the cusp of that change. Right. And our lives could have been a lot different had we been born five, 10 years er er earlier than had we been during the time we were. So it's, I think you're right. There's lots to be learned about uh, the life of African-Americans in this country not so long ago. And speaking of that, uh, we talk about the Green Book. What is that? Who is that? Why should we know more about it? You know, it's funny. The people that used the Green Book, there are very few of them left, right? Most of them have died because it, it stopped being used in 1966. But Victor and Alma Green um, created this tiny little guide that fit in your glove compartment that was, it was really a, almost like a phone book. It really only listed name, address, and then later on phone number. So it was really very much like a phone book, listings by state, of places that you could stay. Hotels, motels, restaurants, guest houses, tourist homes, 
um, and then pharmacies, physicians, dentists, you know, um, and, and the green book was only one of many, many guides that existed. So you can imagine there, there are a host of these guides. Almost none of them are extant because they were made to be thrown away. So even most of the African-American historians that I talked to didn't know about it. Um, 20, 20 years ago, when I was asking people about the Green Book, people had not really heard of it. They were, they were printed on terrible paper and they were made to be thrown in the, in the trash. If you think about the uh, AAA guides, you know, right. you throw one every year and then you throw it away because it's no longer useful. Right. You created another one for the next year. Well, the same thing with the Green Book and with the other travel guide and the traveler's guide, all of these things were, were made to be tossed. I mean, and I think too that it's, it, it, it's you know, the automobile allowed African-Americans um, a way to escape the indignities of Jim Crow. They didn't have to ride in the back of a, you know, in the colored car, in the smoking car. Um, they could now travel when they wanted, as they wanted, um, and where they wanted. So that's the good side of the automobile. The challenge of the automobile, this new form of self-locomotion, uh, with mobility being the defining aspect of freedom, is that, you know, you're traveling across this complicated, haunted space of America. You know, you're, when you go back from Detroit to your family's home for your grandmother's funeral in Mobile, you know, where are you going to stay on your way? Um, you can't stay everywhere. You know, you can't eat everywhere. If, you're, if your daughter has to use the bathroom, you can't use the bathroom. You can't get gas everywhere. So you're, you're, you have this complicated um, experience entirely different from the experience of white motorists. And so the, the green guide then comes up as a way of filling that gap. Well, here is how you're going to navigate that space. You're going to be able to, you know, when you're in Chattanooga, you know, Mrs. Smith has two clean bedrooms in her house on the other side of Main Street. Um, so that's a place you can go and later you can call her up. So it, it is a way of making connections along the road. And not only is it a way of finding the available places that you can sleep, eat, get your hair dressed, et cetera. Go to, the go to a hospital. God forbid your car should get into an accident. You know, the ambulances came first for the white people who, who were killed, who were, who were hurt not for the black people. So it's, it's an entirely bifurcated reality. But it didn't just respond to that, it also generated the culture of it. So that precisely because people were now connected and could know where to go, there was now a greater market for, you know, um, Marsalis Motel in New Orleans or, you know, places everywhere across the country. And so it not only provided a place to go, it provided a surge of commercial activity, of enormous creativity across the country so that by the 40s, 50s, early 60s, you have this vibrant, you know, black commercial culture across the country. Um, so that too is this remarkable aspect, which, you know, the Green Book, you know, is not just a responder, it's a generator um, of connectivity. That's what struck me about the film and about the book is that it talks about the uh, industries and businesses that grow up around the ability for Af Af of African Americans to travel by car, which I think is sort of amazing. And I one, one of the quotes I remember having been said by Green or others that their goal was uh, to bring an end to segregation. Right. Did that happen? Travel is fatal to prejudice. He's quoting Mark. He's quoting Mark Twain when he uses that as his as his mantra. Does it happen? Happen? Does he bring an end to segregation? <sighs> so the end to segregation comes with the civil rights legislation. Right. Right. It it comes with many many people and organizations fighting against segregation. Yes. Yeah. Well, but one of the things that I, I want you all to talk about, I know you talk about in the film is that uh, the end of the Green Book and the end of segregation also brings about the demise, the whole industry connected to it. Yep. So irony. You think about this, is it a good thing, a bad thing? Is desegregation good or bad, do you th think or say in your, in your film? Well, at the same time that this is happening, right, the NAACP, the Urban League, all of these national organizations are fighting to desegregate public accommodations. So 
when they successfully desegregate Hilton and Howard Johnson's, African Americans go there and stay there because they can. Right? They have worked so right. hard right. to break open these these institutions. They go and they stay there. It's not that all African Americans abandon black businesses. It's that some African Americans abandon black businesses, but white Americans never go and support those black businesses. No. That's what we're seeing right now, though. We're you know, seeing think, Americans say, I want to support black business. I'm sorry, Rick, go ahead. No, no, I think that to that and to your question, you know, Spencer, there's this important, you know, did emancipation end the immobilization of African Americans? Right. Yes and no. Right. You know, for a while, you had, with the thanks to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the Civil War Amendments, which came right out of the Civil War, you had an expansion of mobility in every sense for African Americans. We we're now no longer, you know, pinned to plantations. But they got, with the collapse of Reconstruction, and there was also amazing political mobility. You know, thousands of African Americans now in local, state, and, you know, federal positions. Then, then Reconstruction collapses because the pull, angry, you know, sort of backlash against that, very much like the backlash we're going through right now. Having had, a, having had an African-American president, now, whoa, we're gonna really take that back because we're gonna lose some of the perquisites of whiteness if we don't watch out. So that back and forth takes place again and again. And the three big places it takes place in American history is during the Civil War and then the collapse of Reconstruction. Um, and you know, with the segregation movement, you know, those that legal re-mobilization where you know it makes it against the law. Well, there's a powerful, you know, kind of like anti-reconstruction-like backlash to that that takes place. You know, where where you know, it's now technically illegal, but you know, um, uh, as somebody says in our film, you know, you can legis you can make laws, but you can't legislate people's hearts and minds. You can't legislate treatment. So now we've been living in this, the post-civil rights world of how do people treat each other? And within that world, while segregation has ended as a legal phenomenon, I live in New York City and, you know, proud New York City, so proud of its liberal tendencies. It's as segregated as any place in the country by neighborhood, by, by employment, by, you know, I'm here at 110th and Riverside, you know, it's just, it, it is amazing how in the work world, it looks all like a kind of like, you know, you know, multifarious utopia. But when people go home at night, they go home to neighborhoods which are remarkably still segregated. So did it end segregation? It ended segregation as something that could legally be done to black people by white people. It did not end the perquisites of whiteness that come from the wages of whiteness, as W.E.B. Du Bois said, that come from the fact that we want to live, white people continue in alarming numbers to want to live in a world in which they get something merely by being white, that people who are not white don't get. You get more options, you get better schools, you get better pay. Um, and so those, those remain things that are vulnerable to transformation if segregation were complete. And we have, we live in a world in which there is a mighty and ferocious resistance to it. And I think what we're going to do now is we're now at the third great break point, the 1850s, 60s, the 1950s, 60s, and now it's going to be the, the 2020s and what comes after. And it will not end it for sure, but what I know in my heart, thanks to the kind of work that Gretchen has done, is that we are taking a major step forward. You know, George Floyd got murdered this year. There had been a billion George Floyds before this. Why did that catch hold? Something's happening here in this COVID-ridden, Trump-ridden, really impossibly toxic environment. And as Walter Benjamin said, it is moments of danger when the past and memories leap up and you seize hold of them that the real change can come. So we are now going on the cusp of some kind of change and i guarantee us i know we're going to move something forward will it end this phenomenon no but it will take it forward that's i think that's encouraging to us all 
Amir, I've got a quick question for you. So is this a film for American audiences only, or do you see it as an internationally, a film that has an international impact or usefulness as well? Oh, it's definitely an international story. I mean, yearning for freedom, yearning for mobility is, is uh, you, you know, there are caravans all across the world where people are trying to get free. You know, so I, I think that people will see a similarity uh, in that. So yeah, no, definitely. And plus we, we know that the, the BBC mines American stories all the time. So <laughs> it's not like the Brits aren't used to seeing, you know, black American stories told on their public television. It, you know, I wish we could get the BBC budgets to tell our own stories. That would be nice. Uh, right, it was interesting well. to see the, um, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter protests in Europe as well. Summer yeah. Yeah. after yeah. David Floyd was murdered, it, you know that right. said to me that that there's an interest in this story um, abroad. But I, you know, I think what Rick said about COVID is so important because one of the things that white Americans and all Americans learned about this summer was what happens when your mobility is restricted. They had just a little taste of that restriction. You can't go any place. You can't, um, you have to, you have to stay um, in a particular place. You're prohibited from moving. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it's at all the same <clears throat> as segregation or as, as the restrictions in mobility that African-Americans face, but it was a little taste that kind of laser focused our attention on the George Floyd, the Breonna Taylor, the stories that were coming out this summer and this restriction of mobility that we that we all that we all faced yeah. kind of a confluence of those uh events that really made this uh you know kind of focus in on this on mobility well i, I hope you do get international distribution of it when the time comes um, i think we will I, I think we really will because you know it was amazing to see um, what happened, you know, in June after George Floyd's murder. I mean, this was, um, you know, this became an international, you know, social justice movement because, you know, the issues of race and um, labor and uh, wealth um, in America are part of a na international reality. I mean, colonialism, imperialism, you know, this is, you know, this is not, we're not in like some sort of isolated bubble here, you know. Um, we are in an entire world in which these kinds of dislocations and hierarchical suppressions have been going on for a thousand years. And ever since people could actually reach out and begin to act predatorily on a global basis. And so I think that we really are, this is a story that is the American version of a global story. Um, and that it will join hands with versions of this story that people will recognize in Morocco and in Pakistan and in, you know, really, I think around the world. It's not a, just as it is a story that is a national American story in which no part of the American experience is out of it, there's no part of the world experience. And that's what I think is really, potentially so hopeful because it is it is kind of like you can try to stop it spencer it, the ripple is going to grow no, i think that's true now I, I know at the end of the film i've been lucky enough to see uh, parts of the film um in advance you end with uh, a quote from uh, from james baldwin and why did you decide to have james baldwin sort of give a a, a su summary or an overview to the film. You know, I'd, I'd like to say something about that and then hand it over to Amir for a second as well, which is that, you know, there's a huge team of people that make these films. Spencer, you were part of it. Gretchen started it. Amir, producer, editor. You know, Emily File, incredible producer. Catherine Clenard, um, my wife Bonnie, you know, Bonnie Lefebvre, um, who's been the producer in multiple senses in, in our shared lives and is an extraordinarily gifted producer. Bonnie found, she came, Kenny came in and as Amir knows better than anybody else, kind of really, you know, um, there was a certain way in which the film really needed to be kicked in the ass starting last May and she kicked it in the ass really hard. 
um, <laughs> oversaw, oversaw like the final four months of the post-production. It was Bonnie who came up with the James Baldwin quote. And you could end the film many, many ways. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's ama an amazing quote. Um, Baldwin, you know, as lionized correctly as he is, I feel is under, underrated, underestimated. I feel that he is possibly, probably the greatest writer America has produced. Mm. On his slender corpus, um, filled with a very calibrated rage and extraordinary brilliance. And the quote in its full, if I may read it, Spencer? Sure, please. Baldwin wrote in 1963, this past, the Negroes past, fear by day and night, fear as deep as the marrow of the bone, doubt that he was worthy of life since everyone around him denied it. This past, this endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. And here's the kicker at the end. If we, and now by that I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively, relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, insist on and create the consciousness of others, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. And James Baldwin wrote that in 1963 in a book with an extraordinarily sort of, you know, Old Testament title, The Fire Next Time. And I just want to say that this idea of, you know, this extraordinary coming together of this history uh, and the need for coalitions and accomplices and allies um, and the idea that it is the exposure of a reality, which the reality of us all, conscious blacks and conscious whites coming together in an effort precisely by doing so. If we have enough tensile strength and enough kind of physical stamina to change the world, to achieve, I love this phrase, achieve our country. So I go, you know, Bonnie fall, you know, throws that to Amir late one day. Um, and they clip it in and sure is shooting. It like shoots like a bolt of lightning back mm. through the two hours of the film. And you feel, you know, I feel like our, our sound editor, incredible Polish American woman, Marlena Grzelewicz said to me that when she saw a kind of a, you know, a, a still unfinished rough cut of the film, she began to weep and that she felt in that quote, such rage, it made her angry and deeply sorrowful and deeply hopeful and deeply aware all at the same time. And so I feel like, you know, when someone has the genius that Baldwin had to core sample the reality of, of the world as deeply and powerfully as he did, you know, get out of the way, put it at the end of your film, you know, and salute and say goodnight. I mean, Amir, <laughs> man, I would love <laughs> if Amir could just talk a little bit about this process of, you know, of working on this film because, you know, Bonnie was pointing out, you know, you have been this really crucial intermediating pilot, um, weaving between you know, um, all your colleagues as you've weaved, woven together the film. Um, and, you know, you sat there for months and months and months with Catherine Clenard and Emily File, sometimes with Gretchen when she was there, a lot of times with Bonnie, sometimes with me. And so in a way, nobody, you know, you're, you're, no one is more the midwife of this film. No one knows more intimately the blood on the floor, the shots left out. <laughs> you, uh, I would love it to, if you could just speak to that process, because I think it's, you know, work, work is the thing that brings us all together. Sure. Um, 
I mean, you know, you're not you're not the first person to sort of uh, think of editing as as midwifery. Uh, you know, it is a very apt uh, comparison uh, between the two. I mean, you are. I don't know. Have, you, have either of you ever had a baby? <laughs> I have not. I have not. <laughs> But good answer, good answer. Kind of painful the, the, so I well, will maybe, maybe and they are given the amount of cutting that's go, going on, it's more like cesarean section than actual <laughs> but, but but I will say that, that the relatively conscious husbands do have a role in helping to bring their babies uh in into the 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 this world. It, you know, so I, I have been there for the for the birth of both of my children. Uh, and and hopefully it was not a detriment, uh, definitely a detriment after they got here, but in terms of helping to get them here. Um, so I do sort of understand that hand-holding process, but it is a, it is a rather unique thing to help raise something that at the end of the day is really not your child, right? You, you are sort of walking this, this scenario where you are like, helping this thing to take its first steps, but then stepping out of the way so that the parents could, could be there to put the, the child to, to, to run to. And so it is this really interesting thing that as an editor, you sort of get used to. Uh, I'm going to help somebody. I, uh, people, a lot of people do use the midwife comparison. I always think of it myself as the captain of the boat which sounds really important right up until you realize that someone else owns the boat, you know? And so a lot of times you have these conversations where, you know, your director or the owner of the boat says, I really want to take the, the, the yacht to, you know, uh, Cancun. And I'm like, that's a great idea, except there's a really big storm, it, you know, like sort of right in between us and Cancun. Why don't we go around and instead we'll go to Puerto Vallarta or, you know, or something and said, no, no, we, we've got to take this boat to Cancun. There's amazing ceviche there. You've got, we've got to go, we've got to go, got to go. And I'm like, I can see the storm on the horizon. And then you're always sort of faced with this scenario where you're like, do I hand the wheel to him or her and jump off this boat because I don't want to go down with the ship? Sometimes you just put your head down, you go through the storm, and it all sort of dissipates, and then you're chilling in Cancun, you know, eating ceviche, and then you have to turn to your director or the owner of the boat and be like, you were right. You were right. So it's always that process, that sort of give and take of sort of going, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And it's, it, it's a great one. It can be an exhausting one, but it is ultimately a really, really um, satisfying one, uh, and particularly dealing with... Uh, historical projects because you are attempting to weave together you know this history and tell this this story in, a, in sort of a new and fresh way or refocus the lens and we did a lot of that in, in this film where we sort of you've seen this footage before you've seen this headline before you've seen this image before but did you ever look over here you know so we're trying to get people to sort of look at these very familiar things to them in a slightly different way you know, I want to say very quick, want to say very quickly, just uh, I promise I won't kind of like motor mouth too much here. I mean, first of all, this is an astonishing, uh, really brilliant way of describing the process. And, you know, what I would say with this particular topic, the topic, and I think this is happens when films don't fail, the topic itself becomes the captain, becomes the owner of the boat. So the directors are themselves intermediaries and midwives um, and co-captains and the real ownership is that content and sometimes the you know the captains can over dominate and the boat lists to one side or another but what happens in the process and there are really rocky shoals and storms abound is that as the film itself begins to take its own form and shape, it begins to tell the editors, the directors, the producers, what's gonna be. And the really stormy stuff is when someone is so pig-headed and wrong-minded that they can't hear what the film's telling them it must be. And those are the moments 
where the person who has most control is the most frightening Ahab-like person on deck. That's, direct, that's the director. And so what I have to say is that finally everyone becomes disciplined to the film itself and what it needs to be. And in this topic, with this extraordinary ballast of the most important and most contentious aspects of American history, you know, like I approached it, you know, both overweeningly, you know, in a both overbearing way, but also like, J you know, J. Alfred Prufrock. Dare I wear my trousers rolled? Dare I eat a peach? You know, you know, dare I wear my trousers rolled and walk upon the beach? You know, because the more you get into it, the more you realize you're in really, this, it is so complex. Um, Rick, and, I'm going to have to interrupt you. I apologize so much, yeah. but we've got a ton of questions from the audience. I'm going to leave some time for those. So please forgive me. Not at all. Um, uh, well, the first question I have here is, will there be teaching material with the film in the book? Yeah. Because uh, people are feeling that this was a great thing to get in, in, in front of the children. It's, there is, in addition to Gretchen's book, which was published last year, I mean, earlier this year um, in February, um, Driving While Black, um, and really has, she's been kind of um, on the road more or less constantly since then. Um, there's also the, the uh, Mellon Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, um, has, uh, who have supported the film itself, have also supported a very, a very powerful public engagement and educational outreach. Um, initially, that publication, that that educational outreach and the, the public engagement was going to be non-virtual, COVID, and so there's been this massive reorientation, and so we're in the process now of, of creating and working um, to create the digital version of what would have been much more analog and bricks and mortars. So the answer to that is absolutely yes, and, you know, we have enormously high hopes um, that the film will, that the film, more importantly than the film, that the, the material um, will live on um, in, ed in educational situations and in online situations as well. Now, are you creating a specific curriculum and, and those kind of things for this? Absolutely, yep. Gretchen, I know you've been a museum educator. I'm sort of curious about your take on that. Um, it's something that we've, we've, We've actually prepared uh, numerous, we had numerous ideas before COVID hit. <clears throat> and then um, a lot of those ideas, uh, which included a lot of public discussions, opportunities for getting people together, because um, people in this country don't talk to each other. People mm -hmm. that are different don't talk to each other. So our original ideas were all about having dialogues around this topic. Um, and now those dialogues are not going to be able to happen. So to create a more, um, you know, something that can go online that people can can access that way is going to be much more important, I think. I think you're right. One of the questions I have here is, are there elements of this story that were easier to explore in film than in writing? Oh, that's a great question. It's a terrific question. <clears throat> you know, I think that... Um, Writing, no matter how many times it quotes multiple voices, it always comes across like a single flow of discourse. A film brings together a colloquy of voices. And so this, this subject, which is intrinsically multiple um, and multiple, man, you really feel it. And I'll tell you, and I think it's really, you know, the much maligned talking head Oh, come on. <laughs> Talking heads are the most powerful things in the human sphere. When you are a baby and you are born, the most important thing as you sit in your mother's arm is you look up into her head. That the power of the expression, the things that you're getting from it, the subtle, you know, and when our cohort of on cameras. I mean, in Amir had them all up on the wall and kind of, you know, it's amazing to see Amir's editing room um, where there was this whole group of people. To hear them, to hear Christopher West talk about, you know, 
I'm a father. I have a 17 year old son, good kid, smart kid. And then talk about the fear he has that every time he goes out in his automobile, um, something's gonna happen to him. You know, that's gonna be powerful on the page, but I'm telling you the test of the witness um, that film allows, you know, reality to bear is crucial. And so I just, you know, the, the book is fantastic. And at the same time, the film, which has vastly less information, has, there are real people, men and women, talk now and then, talking and communicating about this experience. And I'm telling you, if you listen to these people talk, whether it's James Baldwin or Gretchen Soren or Spencer Crew, and you are not riveted and struck to the bottom of your soul, you ain't alive. But Rick, if I could just jump in for one quick second, the, the power of those moments, especially at the end of the film, is, is that you come to a PBS film, you being the audience, you come to a PBS film to see smart academic people tell you smart academic things about their particular field of expertise. So. Right. Yeah. Having Gretchen Soren, you know, tell us a number of things about uh, the Green Book in the 1950s, we're expecting that. And she delivers, you know, fantastically, but it's sort of like Michael Jordan scoring 30 points. You expect Mike to put up 30 points on the regular, even though I hate him as a Knicks fan. But you, you expect that to, 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 to really happen. For Spencer Crew to say anything intelligent about any aspect of the African American experience, you, you absolutely expect that. It's sort of the price of admission. The interesting thing that, that our film does is that there is a moment in Act Four where they're talking about their lives. And that's something that academics don't often do in PBS films. They tell you in 1935, this happened and, the, uh, and this happened in this way, et cetera, et cetera. And you expect that and you, you, you crave that. But then to see that same person who talked to you about Reconstruction, that same person that talked to you about the Civil Rights Movement say, I have a son. This happened to me. Or I'm worried about this happening to him or to her. Or, or that, that was a really interesting turn. And you know, I've been doing this like you. I've been doing this for a long time. And a lot of PBS films with a lot of academic people with a lot of bookcases and, and plants in the background and I very rarely see the person turn and get real in that way. And so that, that was yeah, what I would say to really add powerful. To that is that what you know, because of the nature of the story, is that everybody has skin in this game from the beginning. You know, right. and so right. even with voices, you know, you hear the opening quote from Alfred Edgar Smith, you know, writing in 1933. And it's clearly an African American voice about an African American experience. And you go, you know what, that's not Alfred Edgar Smith himself speaking. He's long gone. They got an actor. You realize that even that actor in the studio as he was recording it, he was, he had skin in the game. And so there's this powerful sense in which the conveyors are vibrating with what they're conveying, even before it's revealed that it was their daughter. You know, I mean, Faith Ruffins, your colleague saying, you know, the thing I would say to my kids was like your job is when you, if you get stopped by the police your job is to stay alive long enough to get to jail and then we'll take it from there to get you out faith has been talking throughout the whole thing she but yeah and you know that she's african-american and you know that she's been part of this story herself then you turn out it's like she's you know doubly doubled down in how invested she is in it well, there's a question for you specifically, Dr. Soren. And they asked, could you say more about your research process? Your research process, what was it like? And did any primary sources jump out at you as being uh, either surprising or uh, very important? Um, yeah, I would say that one of the most important sources for me was reading all of the black newspapers. The New York Amsterdam News, the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the, uh, the Baltimore Afro-American, reading those newspapers because they had a different, uh, they had an alternative take 
on the on the events of the day. So when um, a young soldier was murdered at Fort Bragg in 1944, that story didn't make national news. That story made all of the national black newspapers. Mm. So those stories, many of the stories that I was trying to expand upon were, I could find in the, um, in the pages of the black press. And so those were very important. The oral histories were essential. You know, talking to people, doing or oral interviews, the ones that um, I started with for the book were only done, as you know, because you were one, you were one of them, um, with a tape recorder. Uh, but I interviewed funeral directors and uh, ambulance drivers and the, the kids sitting in the back seat, now grown up and uh, uh, sitting in the front seat, uh, you know, and, and, and gathered those stories and then expanded from there. And I learned a lot about cars that way. <laughs> Another question is, do you ex expect to create an exhibition ab about this? I'm actually working um, on an exhibition about about this topic with uh, um, the Amistad Center in Connecticut. Oh, okay. And uh, when do you expect it to maybe just to, to uh, I don't know. be available? No, I've got my some of my graduate students doing some research into their collection, and I I don't know. We'll see. But I would yeah. I would really like it to look at contemporary art as well as historical artifacts mm. because oh. there have been so many works of contemporary art in response to this summer's events. Someone asked, what happened to the Greens? I think that Victor Green, um, I, I, this is speculation because I couldn't find out exactly, but he gets, he gets sick in the 1950s and he steps back from uh, managing the Green Book. And his wife, Alma, steps up. And at that point, there are four women operating, publishing, writing the Green Book. And they continue until they sell the Green Book in the 19, in early 1962-63. Um, and neither of the Green, the Greens didn't have any children. So they had only nieces and nephews. And I think someone probably went into the office and shoveled everything into a dumpster and all of the records were lost. Mm -hmm. So there are no records um, for the Greens business, which is it's a very sad thing. But it was at a time when people didn't see the value in African American uh, business records, and they were just they were just tossed. Which is a, really a tragedy. It's something you often face trying to do African American history. It's um, it's a very difficult history to do for that reason. Oh, absolutely. And I, 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 it also strikes me there's an interesting story about the women in this um, saga. Can yeah. you talk a bit more about them and how we should see how they're contributing in important kinds of ways? So women were, were crucial to this story. In addition to Alma Green and, her, and the four women that were working for her publishing the Green Book, women were... Um, essential uh, essential players in the Montgomery bus boycott because yeah. they were they're working right they're they're working every day they want they don't want to take the bus in order not to take the bus someone's got to drive them to work right. so they this fleet of cars they purchase a fleet of cars and the fleet of cars keeps these women working but what are they doing on the weekends on the weekends they're making sandwiches they're frying chicken they're making coconut cakes and they are selling all of these uh, wonderful foods to unwitting, um, to unwitting people, who, many of whom are white, um, and they're taking that money and they're using that money uh, to support the civil rights movement. And one other thing, if, if a, an African-American family had a spare bedroom or two, um, they oh, would yes. their home um, and they would use the, it, it was basically an early bed and breakfast, an early form of the bed and breakfast or of, of an Airbnb. You would use that extra money to support your family. So women were taking that business initiative and you would see Mrs. Jones guest house 
or Mrs. Smith's guest house. And often you would get a breakfast and perhaps dinner um, if you were staying at these places. And the very earliest places in the Green Book were primarily these women who were operating guest houses all over the country. But just, just there's always that backstory that doesn't get the kind of attention you'd like it to get along the way. So uh, as people see the film and are impacted by it, what, what is the takeaway you hope that they um, have with them as they go back and reflect on what they've seen? You know, what both Rick and Amir were saying, I, this is a call to action. You know, we don't want people to watch this film and say, well, that was a really good film. I think we want them to um, say, that was a terrific film and now I'm going to do something. It's going, this, this film has motivated me, has moved me to do something, to take some action, some positive action. So I, I really see it as a, as a call, as a call to get involved, to participate in our democracy in whatever way you can. I hope people will think, oh, I need to go out and vote, but I also need to go out and do something in my community, because this is, you know, there are 17,000 police departments in the United States and they're all independent. There's no overarching police uh, institution. Uh, there are 17,000 and they're all operated in local communities. And that's the place where people can affect change in their own local community. Rick, Amir? You know, I, Amir, go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's hard for me to to come in on the uh, the the thoughts because my thoughts of community policing are are, are very uh, mm. complicated. It, it, you know, there are over seventeen thousand police departments. They are all sort of run uh, individually, but they do all sort of share a, a fraternal link uh, and sort of operating. As, as a larger organization, and that is, you know, one of the problems. But I mean, that's not necessarily a problem uh, that our film was tackling directly, but tangentially, you know, if you're asking me what I, on a personal level, want, I would like to just be able to get a ticket for speeding and, and go about my day and not have to worry about anything past that, you know? If I was speeding, as I am want to do, because uh, I have a, a, a lead foot, it, you know, I just want that ticket and I want to be able to live to, as I've heard many times from people in law enforcement, go home to see my family. That's what I would like to do is just as, if they could see me as human in that way and allow me to go home to see my family, uh, but because they saw this film and they, they were able to sort of contextualize some of their own decisions uh, about uh policing uh especially the the roads uh in america that 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 would be great rick you get the last quick word you know okay listen um you know uh william faulkner said you know the past isn't was the past is is you know but a lot of people a lot of us instinctively feel like you know the past is back then but the past is now and anybody who tells you the past is back then wants to keep things the way they are and what I really felt really strongly with this material was the way in which things which have a kind of a slightly sepia tinge sound to them. Lynching. Come on, man. When I hope our film makes words that sound like they have a historical kind of tempo are absolutely contended. People are being lynched day in and day out. And what I feel in this film is that the past is coming rocketing right back into the present to where, where it was always to begin with. And that, that, call, that inspires anger and it, infall, it inspires activity. It, it hopefully inspires agency and it inspires hope. That would be wonderful. Gretchen, you are the sort of the uh, instigator of all this. Any last comments you want to offer to the uh, audience? <laughs> I, you know, I would, I would just like to say how grateful we are to um, the Kennedy Library for giving us this opportunity to, um, to chat together about this film and about this, and about the book. 
Um, and I hope that people will um, enjoy the film, will watch the film, and will read the book and be inspired to, um, to act. I too want to thank the Kennedy Library for allowing us all to gather together. For me, it's a chance to get together with friends and yep. sit around and have a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you to our panelists. You all have been wonderful, insightful, and I think people gained a lot from our conversation um, back and forth. And I do want to encourage people to see the film when it comes out, because I think it's an important one and one from which you will gain a lot as a result of viewing it and experiencing what it has to share. So to all of you, again, thanks. And to all of you, have a great, great evening. And thank yep. you, audience. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you, guys.